everyone. It's good to see you all. It's uh, Thank you so much, uh, Christine, for the opportunity to be the moderator. And I'd like to introduce our, our special guest today. I'm Mike Weeman, the principal of Trail College. and uh, But our special guest is super special. He's Linwood Barkley. And Linwood's, um, well, well, he wasn't born here. He was born in Connecticut. He's from uh, Darien, I believe, in, in Connecticut. And I've known Linwood for almost 10 years, which, uh, you know, it's, it's great to know that, you know, to have, uh, to have many conversations with them. And so uh, hopefully we can get to some of the points, uh, you know, to a richness with this conversation. So um, just a few things about him. He went to Trent University, which is the reason we're all here in many ways today to hear uh, alumnus talk about, you know, doing right and you know making us proud and he has made us proud because he has done so many things from he started off at, at LEC and and graduated and went right to the Peterborough Examiner and soon afterwards uh you know because he had this pension for writing moved on to the Toronto Star and then became an editor and that'll be that'll be interesting to you know talk about the movement between being an editor and a writer and how that all all, all that fits together and after a while then he became a humor writer for the star and uh, you know that had a good gig but you know he had always been writing books and we're going to hear more about that on the side and in 2007 no time for goodbye came out and it was huge it was a really incredible event and no time for goodbye in 2018 that book alone had over 750,000 copies sold in the UK. In 2018, in fact, I think 2.5 million uh, Linwood Barclay books had been sold in the UK. I remember being in London in 2018 and there was a big poster in the underground and my son said, oh, look what Linwood did. And we looked and there was a big poster right beside him in the, in the, in the tube car that said Linwood Barclay. And it's like, wow. And they, they were sort of impressed, but they said, you know, it's a, it's a nice poster, but you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not the biggest poster in the underground, but I was duly impressed that he, everywhere you looked, Linwood's uh, books are there. And of course, London and England is a huge following, but globally, Correct me if I'm wrong, Lynn, but I think over 7 million copies of your books have been sold globally in- Something like that, yeah. In Sounds many cool. languages with it. It's amazing when you think of it and coming up in May, find you first. Is it your 25th? Uh, well, I think it's the, I think it's the 20th adult novel. I, you know, if there's other books you count in there. There's, you know, I did a memoir years ago. I did a couple of books for kids. So, I mean, I'm probably, counting all those I'm probably around 25 26 books but in terms of just the adult thrillers we're at this I think this is 20. Wow and so 20 adult thrillers plus a lot of non-fiction humorous non-fiction such like uh Mike Harris ate my my dog I believe that was one and then uh ate, you know, made maybe, me ate my, maybe dog. ate my dog even worse right and uh you know uh this house is nuts um, all, all, sort, all sorts of things like that. So there's a lot of grist here to talk about today. So I just wanted to kind of paint the picture of Lynn was a truly great guy and he's done truly great things. And, you know, this publishing is amazing too. Cause you know, I'm an academic. So if I publish like a hundred books, that's, 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 that I can, you know, I can go out for, to Starbucks with the royalties and have a good time. So Linwood really has done well. Uh, and, and with 7 million books and counting, it is kind of amazing, but what's great is how humble he is about it all. So let's get right into the questions. We have tons of questions, um, some that I pulled out of my butt, others that people thought long and hard about and have submitted had, to us. I had one for you right off the top, which oh. is how long have you gone without a haircut? Well, I think we got the same, I got the Linwood swoop going today. I think, you know, oh. it's, it's been about six months. Yeah, I, mine was November 25th was the last time I was, was I got the last day I could. I got a haircut. Oh, so you see, you're better than I. I, I had to cut my bangs because they were sort of down in my nose area, but uh, but the rest is, so it's now like a mullet. So it's like party, well, it's party everywhere now. It's party at the front, party at the back. There's no business with my head. I, just, I just determined the other day that if I did not have hair, I could probably do a comb over with my eyebrows. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, I That's forgive me for interrupting. Hey, no, 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 no. I was just going to say more nice things about you, but interrupt away because you know that gets me out of that. But no, it's it's lovely to see you, Linwood, and thank you. And I, I, enough about you know the the accolades and that because they are impressive. But let's get right down to the meat of the the, the matter. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. You know what originally brought you. Know I said you're from Starian, Connecticut. Is that correct? Uh, Starian, yeah. It's um, it's a it's uh, it's you know it's on the commuter line into new york city it's near near new haven and between new haven and bridgeport um and uh i my parents moved to canada while i was still three just before i turned four years old we moved up here my dad was a 
a commercial artist working advertising. And it's back in the 50s, all, of, all the car ads, you know, Magnum Life Look, Saturday Night Post, and all the car brochures, they were all illustrations instead of photography. And my dad drew those cars, and that was his job. And there was an advertising agency in Toronto run by, I don't know if people remember the name, Charles Templeton, a noted Canadian broadcaster. So his brother ran an ad agency, and they, and they hired my dad to come to Canada. So came up here when I was moved up here to the to the suburbs to what became Mississauga and uh, been here ever since. Wow. And so you're a car guy and so I, I guess you get some of that from come from that upbringing right with your father and his drawings and that. Yeah I was I mean I was surrounded by automotive illustration you know and um, and cars and model cars and so forth so I just loved all that stuff and still do I'm a car I'm a car nut. And uh, so, yeah, I was just surrounded by it. My, my parents would tell me that when I was like at the age of two, they could stand me on the street corner and I could identify every make and model that went by. And there's a Chevy, that's a Ford, that's a Pontiac. So, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if that's a usable skill, but I could do that. <laughs> No, that's great. You know, it's a lot of kids were talking about dinosaurs, but oh no, you 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 knew you knew where you were going. You know what to talk about. But so so you then moved to Bob Cajun, and so what's you know uh, you know other than the constellations, what was revealing yourself themselves to you? So what happened there was, and I hope you're not getting too much noise from the street. There's a bobcat running all over the place here. Anyway, um, the machine, not an actual. But anyway, um, what my dad did as a an, an illustrator was like kind of being a modern day blacksmith. He was certainly, he was very good at something that nobody wanted anymore because as the sixties took over, um, photography killed illustration in advertising. And so my parents decided on a kind of second different career. And my mom was always interested in sort of recreation property and stuff. So they bought a cottage resort and trailer park called Green Acres, about three miles south of Bob Cajun on Pigeon Lake. And so they bought that in 1966 um, when I was 11. And uh, and then for the first while, my dad was still working for the ad agency doing other things and was commuting back and forth on weekends. And then around, and I was still going to school in, the, in Mississauga. But when it came to when it was time for me to go to high school, my parents decided to make a more sort of significant move. And I started high school in Fenland Falls. And that was when we really kind of just started really developing some roots in that area and, and left the suburbs behind of Toronto. And, but what happened and why I ended up going to Trent, I mean, I would love to tell you that I went to Trent because I read everything and it was the most amazing university on the planet, which it actually turned out to be, but that wasn't why I went. I, my, when I was 16, um, my dad died of uh, lung can complications from lung cancer. And I essentially took over running the family business, the, the cottage resort, trailer park, all the stuff that was involved and looking after my mom who did drive and to some degree looking after an 11 year older brother with schizophrenia and so forth. So I get the age of 16, just kind of instantly had to grow up because I had all this immense responsibility. And, um, and because I had so much to do on the home front, I looked and Trent University was the, was the school that I could commute to because we were open until Thanksgiving. And so I was running back and forth, like my first, you know, the first, my four years at Trent from sort of Labor Day or when school opened until Thanksgiving, I was running back and forth all the time, you know, leaving a, a you know, classical literature class and racing back to Bob Cajun to bury fish guts from, from whatever had been, you know, the farm, the, the fishermen had caught that day or clean out boats or cut grass and stuff. So I was running back and forth all the time. So that's why, that was why Trent was selected because it was, I could still help on the home front. It was back and forth all the time. So that's how that kind of came about. Cause you could, I could get to Trent. It's funny, but I was, I was, Bob Cajun was sort of situated that I could either go south around um, the bottom of Pigeon Lake down around, I think it was Emily Provincial Park down that way, or I could go the north way around through Buckhorn and down. It was kind of, you know, it was set. so in either way it would get me to Trent in about 35 minutes. And, you know, and, you know, um, I can appreciate the idea of having to grow up quickly. And, and I think the, the writing question would then be, were you writing before your father's death? And did that stop? Did that event stop you from your writing or did it actually accelerate the writing process for you? 
I don't think it had any, I don't think it had anything, anything specific at the time. I started writing stories like crazy around, I don't know, grade five, somewhere in there, grade five, grade six. Um, so I was, you know, I, I, again, I would love to tell you that I was, I was motivated to write by reading the works of Shakespeare and Hemingway and so forth. But actually, I was motivated to write because of television. So I was a kid of the 60s and I had all these favorite shows like Mission Impossible and The Man from Uncle and all of these things. And an episode a week wasn't enough for me. So I had to take these create these characters that were created by others and write my own adventures. And when I was, I think I was, when I was in grade six or so, handwriting took too long. So I got my dad to teach me how to type on this old, I think it was a royal, old royal manual typewriter that weighed about the same as an Oldsmobile. And I would uh, write 30, 40 page novellas based on my favorite shows. So I was doing that like crazy from about the age of 12, 13 on. And, and even as I moved further into my teens, I would, even when I was at Trent, I was writing, it's what we would call fan fiction today. And I was writing, you know, 60 page Columbo novellas, um, stuff like that. So I don't think that my father's death specifically had an impact on the writing. Uh, so much as it did on everything else, which was making me sort of have to grow up instantly. And which I think even to this day has a kind of impact on me and that because I was, I was saddled with doing everything. I mean, my mom sent me to pick up my dad's casket. That's how much I had to do. And so I now, even through, you know, adults and stuff, I always assume that no one else in the family has had to do anything. I figured that I should do it for them. And everybody has to remind me that, you know, hey, yeah, we're not stupid. We can do stuff. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Maybe we can talk more about this later, but perhaps it created a sense, uh, would you agree that maybe a sense of discipline perhaps in your writing? Because you keep a quite a busy pace, uh, you know, in, in your contracts and your what you have to produce. Yeah, I think that the, in many ways, the discipline came from working for 30 years in newspapers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for the first, I mean, I started at the Peterborough Examiner. I was at the Examiner for two years, although I say four if you count overtime. But I was there from 77 to 79 and writing stories, you know, new stories like crazy. And then I spent two years at a small paper in Oakville. And then in 1981, I got hired at the Toronto Star. Now, when I went to the Star for an inter a new job interview, they said, well, we don't really need reporters. We got plenty of those, but we're desperate for editors. Do you have a lot of editing experience? And I said, sure, um, you know, a, a lie. And, uh, and so I got thrown into editing and working on the city, that stuff. And I turned out to be something that I was very good at. Um, so, you know, whether it was writing or whether it was editing, you know, you had to produce a thing that was about as long as a book, but you did it every day. And so working in newspapers, I think, taught me uh, discipline and, 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 so, and treating writing as a job. I mean, a favorite question, maybe it's well, someone's going to ask it later, but a favorite question is, oh, I see it already. If you experienced writing, someone asked, Marissa asked, said, if you experienced writer's block, see, that's, the, that's a common question. I don't get writer's block because when you've worked at a newspaper, like I did, I was calling, I wrote three columns a week for 14 years for the star. And imagine if you were to phone the editor and say, you know, I'm just not feeling it today. Uh, I just thought this muse hasn't struck so far. They'd say, well, why don't you go work at the Globe or the Sun or somewhere else, you know? And, and so writing this job, you get up in the morning, you go to work. And so, uh, for me, writer's block, I always say, well, do you get professor block? Do you get, you know, plumber's block? Do you get teacher's block? Do you get accountant's block? I mean, I always think, aren't writers so precious that we have our own condition to describe just not doing any work? And so I, I understand there, I think with any job, any profession, for whatever we do, there will be days where it's just, you can't get it together. And, and we all get that, but, but a sort of thing for where, you know, I just, I can't produce a book because I have writer's block. I, I don't particularly subscribe to that because it's a job. I get up in the morning and I think I have to get, if I'm in the thick of a book, and I get up in the morning and I have to get 2000 words done. That's the goal. And that might only take three, four hours. It might take five. Um, some days you can do better than that. Some days not as much, but if you can average that, you've got 10,000 words 
in a week. And at that pace, in two and a half months, you'll have a first draft. And that's the way I work. Yeah, no, and I'm glad you brought that up. I always like you hearing you talk about, you know, writer's block and, you know, you know, a plumber thinking, yeah, I just don't feel like unplugging that toilet today, right? You know, it's a, you, you got to do it, right? And I think that sort of discipline is good for people to hear that you have to, to keep at it. But, you know, the, you've met a lot of people in your life that may have also given you lessons like you know, the editing and working through the star and the other papers. But, you know, if we go back a bit to, to Margaret Lawrence, you know, were there any lessons that, you know, coming across Mar Margaret, that's the Trent connection for you. And, and, and is there something that you took away from that relationship that, you, you know, affects your writing today? So when Margaret was, was, um, did her first stint as writer in residence, she had this place in Champlain. Um, I think I'd read one short story by her in high school and something from, maybe it was from this side, Jordan or something. And so, but I thought, here's someone who gets, who's made money, whose job was to write books. So I gotta go see her. So I went and I took <clears throat> things that I'd read, written and so forth. And she read them and I come back in a week and we talk about it and so forth. And then over the summer, cause she was going to come back in the fall over the summer, I read like five of her novels. And when I came back in the fall, I said to her, she must have thought I was the biggest jerk ever. I said, you know, I felt bad that you were reading all my stuff last last spring and I hadn't read any of yours, but I read your stuff over the summer. It is pretty good. And uh, what a jerk, you know what I mean? But she was very encouraging. And and we make we developed a friendship that lasted well up, up until her passing. And even when I was at the examiner, and if I had some big, huge story, I covered a massive fire or whatever, and there was my name on the front, the phone would ring and it'd be Margaret. She'd say, hey, kiddo, wow, way to go. So I think what Margaret did for me was that this was, this she was an honest to God writer. And she really had a confidence in me. She saw something and that itself was encouraging that she would see that I was someone who was worth talking to, to, to mentor, to so forth. So she was a, she was a great influence and she was helped to build one's confidence. You know? Yeah. And yeah, no, for sure. And a, you know, that, that, that kind of relationship with Trent, you know, those early days, I, I think is such, you know, there's almost a romance about that, that era and talking about romance, you have two lovely children and they, they got you via your lovely wife, Nitha, who is also an LA seer. Did you, did you want to talk a little bit about meeting Nitha and, and, uh, well, that's probably the best thing I came away with from Trent more than the uh, honors BA in English was Nitha. Um, I met Nitha. She was she was actually in residence at Lady Eaton. I was affiliated with Lady Eaton, but I lived in town because my mom, my family had bought a duplex. This is among the other things that I ended up having to be responsible for. But I, so I had the basement apartment in this duplex that they owned on the south uh, east end of town. So I didn't live there, but but uh, but I lit, Nithi I met, I think Nithi I met in, we ended up sitting together in some English class, in some lecture that, is, that, that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And I remember writing notes to her, it was like high school, writing notes that was basically, this makes absolutely no sense at all what this professor is saying. And later, I'll tell you who it was, Michael. But um, <laughs> but anyway, I just thought it didn't make sense. But actually, the first time we'd met was at the uh, bus terminal in Peterborough, where I was waiting for my brother to come in to pick him up, and Nitha was getting on a bus to go, and we chatted. And I thought, wow, she's really nice, and she has absolutely no memory of that event um, of our first meeting. So that's the kind of impression I made. But um, <laughs> we we. Uh, we became very close in, in her last year at Trent. And I had one more year to go and she and Nitha went off to the faculty of ed in Toronto for a for last year while I was still at Trent. And then when we were both finished that summer, uh, we got married and, and got, went to Peterborough. I got a job at the examiner and Nitha got a teaching job at the, with the Peterborough County Board. No, and, and that's wonderful to have that kind of relationship so early and 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 uh, you know it's just and and I love your stick to itness. you know if there's one story it's kind of like if the girl doesn't remember the moment just keep on you know get to the next moment like I, I just love you no matter just keep stick to I it. I didn't find out till years later after we married when I happened to bring this up I said well you remember when we first met at the bus terminal and she was like no so you know yeah, yeah. It's not the first person I have failed to make an impression on. It's something I'm good at. I can do it 
you know, awesome. Well, <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. Uh, I, I have one more comment, uh, question that I've written down. And then I know there's lots of comments that we've got a few more that people have written to us before. And I know that the, there's tons of people here that would love to say some things. But I just, the last thing I wanted to talk about was about the, you've written both fiction. We got at that before over, you know, 20 novels of fiction, um, four or more nonfiction. Is there a form that you prefer? Is there a form that you find that you really enjoy writing more or is writing, does it kind of exercise different muscles and so you enjoy equally? Working? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's, I don't know. I mean, my bread and butter is fiction. You know, that's what pays the rent. And and so, but I mean, when I was writing a column, I was writing sort of a personal humor column and, and, and political satire. And that stuff was all fun too. So, I mean, it's, it's, I don't mind switching gears and it's not hard for me to sort of, you know, get from one horse on to another. And, and, uh, and when I was, you know, I was, the first four novels I wrote, I wrote while I was still doing about 130 columns a year for the star. And so I would knock off a column and then I think, I'm going to spend the rest of the day working on this book. And so you would like totally switch gears for writing a 600 word column where the ideas are compressed to switch to something totally different. But you know, it was, I don't know, it's just books are longer. <laughs> it's a main difference for me. And I remember you saying how regardless, you just hate footnotes. So as long as you're writing. Oh, the, I, was, the <laughs> I was about to say something inappropriate about the words that would precede footnotes. But that's that to me was the worst thing about university was worth footnotes and bibliographies. Like, does it, do I have a semicolon here? Does this have to be underlined? Where does it, screw all that. I mean, just make it up. That was my feeling, you know, just, I remember with, remember the wonderful Lee Beach, who was the, the taught uh, an English psychology course when I was there. And I said to him, instead of doing this essay, could I write like a short novel? And he said, sure. So I think I wrote a 90 or 95 page novel for him. And I just did that so I wouldn't have to figure out footnotes basically. <laughs> okay, well, I wish I'd learned that before I started to be a historian, but you know, oh, that's like a five, six page essay with footnotes or 95 pages, just make it up, man, that's the way to go. That's what <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I've made up all these questions. So how about we start going to the uh, the audience? Some people have written them down. Um, and I might, is that okay, Christine, if I just read from the chat? Um, Absolutely. I, I thought we could invite anyone who wanted to ask their question live as well. Well, uh, let's let's go back and let's scroll up and I'll I'll mention names and see if they if people would like to say that. Um, I think there was one, the, the writer's block one was, I think, Mar Mar Marissa okay. answered that one. Yeah, and then now we're Christopher. Um, uh, Christopher, yeah, there you are. Sorry, would you like to talk about your question? Go for it. You mean like out loud? <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, my, my question was uh, that I put in the chat was that uh, I do a lot of humor writing and people that I read to kind of know me as a humor writer. The other day I read to my writers group something that wasn't humorous. It was actually a a scary thing. It was supposed to be scary, but everybody laughed as I read them. They thought they expected each sentence to be funny. And I just wondered about your transition from, because I remember you as a Toronto Star humor writer as well. I just wonder about your transition from one to the other uh, genre. What, not so much your personal transition, but people's perception of you. Did, did you have trouble talking to publishers, uh, agents, things like that? Well, it's funny. First of all, when I started doing novels, I wrote four sort of what I would call comic thrillers about a character named Zach Walker. And, and there, so I, I, these were novels that were sort of intended to be sort of satirical and funny and it kind of drew out of the column. But certainly publishers, I mean, I mean, first of all, I couldn't get a Canadian publisher for those books, but Bantam Books in New York liked them and bought them. They didn't even know I was a columnist. They didn't know anything about what I did. So there was no sort of connection between my day job and the book for them. They just read the books, thought we like this. This is this is funny. Um, but it's but it was uh, and it was funny when I I did those for those four funny novels, and which collectively sold you know like seventy copies or something, and and that's kind of why I switched gears to writing more serious thrillers because comic thrillers, funny crime novels 
are a really small segment of the market. You know, there's Janet Ivanovich and there's, um, uh, see, I'm already done. Um, there was, uh, well, Carl Hyacin is still doing them. And there was Donald Westlake wrote funny ones and so forth, but it, it's a very small part of the market. And that's, and that, and so to, to combine suspense writing with humor is a really kind of delicate balance because if it gets too funny, it's no longer suspenseful. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's walking that line. And when I was writing some of the later novels, I would still be influenced by the way I did some of the earlier stuff. And I would have editors from my agent who said, you know, you got to rein it in this part. This is funny, but it doesn't belong in this book. It doesn't work. But maybe what happened with you is they were just, you know, they were used to you being funny. So when you said something that was meant to be terrifying, they just were laughing. They were being polite. <laughs> they thought, well, this isn't as funny as this other stuff. It's kind of creepy, but let's laugh. So we'll just play along. Yeah, funny haha -ha versus funny. <laughs> um, well, th thank you, uh, uh, Chris, for that. Um, uh, Francis, did you want to uh, voice your comment or how would you like to go forward? I can read it to you. Um, sure, I can say it. That's Please fine. do. Okay, uh, I had two questions actually. Um, one question I had was, do you have other authors that you like to read as well? Other people that you love their work as well? Like. Oh yeah, well there's far, a lot many to even try to mention. Yeah. Um, just, it's such a huge list and there's a lot of people that I really love. Um, you know, I think probably my all-time favorite crime writer from when I was a kid was Ross McDonald. Okay. And, and of course, I became an immense fan of Margaret's work. And these days, there's a, you know, there's a lot of people who, when they come out with a hardcover, I don't wait. I just have to get it. And you're like James Lee Burke or I'm waiting for a new book from Wayne Johnson. In, yeah. In, 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 or and I'm a huge Stephen King fan. So he's got a new one coming in August. So, so it, but it's a, it's a long list. People who, and it's interesting to read different kinds of people. You know, when I read like I had different kinds of things, I mean, there was a time when all I read was mystery, and now, like you know, I read Obama's new book, or mm -hmm. and and there's some kind of mix it up more than I used to. Yeah. My other question was, um, is writing something you see as a vocation, like not just a job, but like something as a way of life, like you, like it's something you have to feel you have to do, not like something you need to do. That's well, it. that's a tricky one. I mean, I don't, one thing I don't do is I don't kind of romanticize it. It's a job and, and it is my job. Like this is what I do. And, and cause I'm contract, I'm on contract to do a book a year. So it's, it's very much a job, but it is a way it's, but it, like anybody, you know, like for Michael, being a professor is a way of life. And being a writer is a way of life. It's just easier, you know, because you just you don't have to punch a clock. You don't have to do a commute, and and people think you're really thinking about something important, and really you're just completely zonked out. So it's it's you know it's like that. It's not like having it's not a it's better than working in a bank, and uh, but it is a job, and and so I try to treat it that way. But it is a way of life, and and I've been fortunate in the last you know 10, 12 years that it has afforded us opportunities to do things I might never have imagined. Like if we were to Australia, trips to France, we went over to France, they made a TV series out of one of my books in France. And so we've, it's, we've gotten to see a lot of places and done a lot of things that we probably never would have imagined that we might have done. Okay, thank you for answering. Thank you for the, the question, Francis. And, you know, hindsight sometimes puts things together, as you're saying, like you look, you, you go, wow, this afforded me these types of things. But you look back and you think, well, it wasn't always that easy. And Marissa's question was about uh, finding a publisher. Now you talked about Zach Walker. Marissa, yeah. did that answer you? Or did you want to talk more about the publisher question? Yeah, I'd like to maybe get a little more information about it. Just like uh, when you're starting out, did you have to like send out samples or did they find you? Well, when I was, first of all, when I was like at Trent and in my early 20s, I was writing novels and I was sending them to publishers and they were sending them back almost as fast as fast as they could. You know, I could go to the post office and mail it away and it'd be home by the time I got there. So, but when I started, when I was, after I had, uh, when it came to writing the novels, uh, and I was writing that first Zach Walker book, and this would have been around 2001, 2002, it was at that point that I thought, well, I'm sort of a big boy now, maybe I need to find an agent. 
And so I sent some of the early chapters to a literary agent. And in fact, it was funny. I called her up and uh, I got her on the phone. And I said, I wanted to get your email address. I wanted to send something to you. And she said, what? I said, well, I'm writing a comic thriller. And she said, oh. She said, <laughs> she said, she said those are very hard to do. Very few people do very well with them. But if you want, you can email me the first chapter. So I emailed me the, her the first chapter. And she emailed me back the next day. And she said, send me chapter two. And so she took me on. She saw, and she's been my agent for 20 years now. And, and so she finds me a publisher and, you know, look and entertains offers and we see where we can go and so forth. So, so I'm unfortunate in the sense that that's her job. And then when, um, and she'll run interference for me, you know, if I if I've have editors who want to change something that I don't want to change, although just about every editor I've worked with has made suggestions that made a book better, you know, and if she thinks that I'm, I'm right to say, well, look, it's your book. And she'll run interference and say, it's not going to do that. Um, but so I haven't had to go find the publishers. I've had publishers who have, have wanted, who have sought me out or have tried to win me away from a current publisher and that kind of thing. But it's different when you're starting out uh, for sure. But I do think uh, finding, you know, depending on where, what stage you're at, finding a really good literary agent is a very helpful thing. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, Emily, it's good to see you. Um, I see you have a question. Do you mind uh, voc vocalizing your question? Yeah, uh, I would love to. So um, I did a year abroad in France last year and I didn't sleep at all. I couldn't figure out the whole like switching your sleep cycle over with jet lag. So I ended up reading a lot of your books when I was supposed to be asleep. Um, and the suspense always got me like it just the story just kept I just wanted to keep reading, keep reading. How do you build up that suspense? And do you know when you start writing your book, what's going to happen at the end? Like what the solution to the mystery is? Or is it a surprise for you? Good questions. First, first question for you is if you were in France, were you reading the French editions or English editions? English editions. <laughs> France happens to be one of my best markets. That's all I have. Um, uh, so yeah, the fact that they're page turners. Like, I think that a really good thriller has a sense of momentum that it's this ball that starts rolling down a hill and gets faster and faster as it goes. And so I have a couple of feelings about that. And well, first of all, the, the latter part of your question is when I start a book, uh, but if I'm actually starting to write it, and I've made some notes and thought about it, I know where I want to end up. So I know the big picture. I know who's done what. Uh, I know pretty much or think I know what the ending is going to be. What I don't know is what's going to happen completely in this, what I call the big mushy middle. You know, a lot of times when you write a book, the first 80 pages just fly by. You're setting it all up. You're getting the characters. You're setting up a situation. And you know how your book's going to kind of come together at the end. But then it's like, what the hell goes in the middle? There's a big, huge part of the middle. And I don't see the opportunities that exist in the middle in the story kind of until I get there. So that's kind of winging it but there's a bigger kind of master plan. I think of it as like, I've got, you know, it's like for a building house, I've got the blueprints. I know what the foundation is. I know what the house is gonna look like when it's done. But once I start going in, I think, maybe we should put the kitchen just over there instead of here. Or why don't we repaint this from this color? Let's do that. So it's the little things that I can't foresee. So that, to answer that question. But in terms of the pacing, it kind of goes back to my earlier comment about, uh, being a kid of the, of the 60s who was addicted to television. And, and I think that uh, I always feel that, that chapter breaks in a book are like commercial breaks. You know, you take some up to a point and then you give them a little twist or a little mini cliffhanger. And then you have this sort of graphic white space and then another chapter and another number. And I think that's where you put in those sort of pivotal moments. And if you time them that they come at that way, that's, what I think drives you to go to the next chapter. Sometimes I'll read other writers who take a really major point, a big reveal in a story, and they drop it dead center in the middle of the chapter and I think, that's, don't do that. It doesn't work there. Put it at the end. Give us a moment to go, what? You know, like it's commercial break. And now we can sort of go, holy mackerel, I'm just gonna run to the bathroom and get a sandwich and I'm gonna come back. And and that's, and I think that that you, you, know, you can vary chapter lengths and so forth, but you try to end each chapter with 
just something. It doesn't have to be a big reveal, but just a little something. And every once in a while, you'll have a chapter that's huge kind of twist or something going on. But I think those are the things that kind of build momentum in a thriller. And, and, and so, and even those, I don't plan them out ahead. I just kind of, it's kind of, you have a sense of rhythm as you're writing it thinking, okay, I think this is what I need here. And sometimes it'll be, well, what's the most logical way to end this chapter? And is there a way that I could not do that? Is there a way to give you something in the last couple of lines or something in this chapter that's not the way the chapter you would expect it to end? So that it's like, you've got to keep going. If that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. Pleasure. Th thank you, Emily. Uh, and we have a few more questions, so we're going to keep on going down the list. But you, your question made me think, um, so I'm just going to cut in for a second, Emily, because you, you inspire me. Um, both Stephen King and Ian Rankin have said nice things about your mastery of suspense and what you do. And I know that. Uh, so do you guys ever get together and talk about these things, about what makes suspense or what, or is this something you just kind of, it's a, everybody nods and we agree that we do a good suspenseful job? I don't know. When I, you know, when I, it's a couple of years before all this happened, I went with Ian took me to the Oxford bar when I was in Edinburgh, you know, where his character Rebus always goes for a drink and so forth. And I find that we don't really, I find that with other writers, we don't talk about the craft as much as we talk about, oh God, a book tour or, or, or funny stories about how you had this big event planned and, and one person came or, you know, stories that of, of humiliation or with well, this publisher is, uh, I wouldn't go with them or this other writer I did an event with him, he's crazy. You know, like stuff like that. But talking about the craft, I never, almost never. Um, you know, uh, we don't really talk about that I, I, it's in my experience. It's about other things. Was this a good festival? Was that good? Or what's it like? You know, how's it going? And and it's uh, it's kind of more like that. Uh, it's kind of too like when I go to to um, crime fiction festivals or literary festivals and so forth. You'll there'll be all these events coming up, and there'll be panels about authors talking about how they do what they do. I don't go to any of them, and I don't I don't know many authors that do because it's like, well, I know what I do. I don't hear how you do what you do. I'm, sick to death of talking about it <laughs> so yeah. you know the people who go to those things are people who are interested in, in maybe developing a career in writing it's really funny i was in an event one time Nitha came my wife came and and uh and i was just talking about writing how i do what i do and there were people in the audience who were making notes and so forth and Nitha came up she was just astonished she came up to me afterwards she said people were writing down what you were saying <laughs> i said i was i was no more. I was as shocked as she was, frankly. <laughs> That's great. Well, <laughs> well talking about writing down what you're saying, uh, is, is it male or Maya? Did, did you want to talk about your question? Sorry, I'm just unmuting there. It's Miley. Yeah. Miley. Um, hi. I, I just wanted to ask you, I, I, I really love your thrillers. Um, but years ago, I used to read your columns in the Star, and I just love them because I'm I'm actually these days looking for funny stuff because I need it. Yeah, real. And uh, I know that, for example, Scott Festchuk wrote the Future and Why We Should Fear, which is a collection of his essays or his articles, his columns. And uh, Gary Lawton's published several books. Yeah. Have you ever thought about taking your columns and compiling them into a book? Because I know you'd sell at least one copy. <laughs> well, uh, well, I did back in 1996. I think it was 96 uh, or 97. We did a I did a collection of columns called "This House Is Not Sort of the, the Domestic Stuff," and um, I did a funny book about fatherhood and a memoir, and then I did this Mike Harris book. But there's I uh, someone else asked me this question last week on Twitter. Um, First of all, publishers have absolutely zero, zero enthusiasm about doing a book of columns, and they would have even less enthusiasm about doing columns that ran more than 15 or 20 years ago. And so they think there's just no market for it. And, and also, um, a lot of the columns that I wrote were sort of satirical things that were tied to current events. So they're just so out of date now. So. Oh, but I'm I'm delighted that you think that that it would be nice to have one of those. That's I, mean, I appreciate that. But I know that there isn't a publisher in the world who want anything to do with it. 
<laughs> just say, no, forget it. And it, from my point of view too, I'm, and while I'm proud of the work I did as column, it's kind of, now I look at it and think, well, it's like baby pictures. You know, I think I wouldn't have done that that way now, or I don't like this one, or I wouldn't have done that one. And I'd probably be just as, pla just as glad that nobody ever saw them. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. And then thank you, um, Christine. Oh, it's Christine. You have you have a couple questions, did you? Uh... Christine, I have a question. Um, last year, just before the pandemic hit, we uh, were lucky to uh, it, have Kelly Armstrong come and speak oh, yeah. to us, and uh, and she had made a move to write some young adult kind of children's books, and you've made that move as well. And she was motivated by um, her own kids saying, you know, mom, can I read your work? And her saying, no, you can't. Um, I wondered what motivated you to, to write Chase and to move into that genre. I wrote two, two, uh, two novels for young readers, Chase and Escape, and they're linked. Mm -hmm. they're back, Escape takes place like within hours of the end of Chase. So it's a two, kind of a two-parter. And what happened there was um, I had an idea. I got an idea about, I woke up at like two in the morning as is often the case and I had an idea about a, a dog that was part of a special secret project that was outfitted with all sorts of software that could be used for intelligence work. And he was outfitted with like, so this is a dog that, that understands speech and can collect things, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and so I was telling my wife about it in the morning. She said, she said, and I said, it's not really like what I like typical novel. It's more like a kid's book. And she said, yeah. she said, yes, you should write it. She was really excited for me to write it. And so I took a run at it around, first took a run at it around 2011. And then I got busy with something else. And then I came back to it a few years later. So I did the two and I'm really proud of them. They're really good books. They, in fact, the, the, both of them won, the Arthur Ellis, the Canadian Crime Writing Award for Best uh, Young Adult Juvenile Fiction. The, what's that award? There's on the wall here, where is it now? It's the, uh, there's an Ontario Award for Best Kids Book that in won that and so forth. But um, I did the two, but they didn't do the kind of business that I kind of hoped that they would. And I was finding that, that I was still, I still had a commitment to do an adult thriller a year. And at the time that I was working on the second of the kids' books, I was also writing a possible TV series for ITV in, in the UK. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. I was just so much stuff to do that I was just, it's, it was killing myself. And so I thought, well, something has to go. And, and so I thought, I just, I, I'm gonna drop the kids' books and the screenwriting stuff I do when it really seems like the right thing to do, but <clears throat> the main focus for me every year is the is the adult thriller. So I did the two. I I would think they're I'm really happy with them. I think they're great, and I hope maybe they'll still find an audience at times. But that's was kind of the story of that. Well, my daughter's got it on the go now, so yeah. uh, definitely an audience. How different is it to write for young adults as opposed to uh, your other books, which are definitely fewer fewer f bombs. Okay. Yeah. Um, Fewer F bombs, which is really too bad because kids know them all anyway. Um, it's, you know, the, all the same principles apply. Mm -hmm. um, the writing was maybe just a titch simpler, but not really. And there still was a sense of momentum, ending a chapter on a twist, all that stuff. It's just the book was shorter. I think my novels typically run about 100 to 110,000 words. The, the kids' book was around 60, uh, 60,000. So it was a little shorter. But I say that all of the other things, there were some considerations that I had some very good editors who said, you know, that, that in a book like that, the kids themselves need to be the agents of what happens. They can't be reacting to things. They need to be creating the action and advancing the story. Because I had a couple of places where sort of adults were doing things and kids were reacting. And they said, no, it's better to have it the other way around. I thought, oh, of course. So there was, there was a bit of rethinking in how one, to approach the story but all the, all the usual rules applied you know and uh except for you know all the, the all the swearing i could do that <laughs> thanks too bad i love that yeah no my my kids really love the escape and chase they had a good time you know read, read that yeah. and i you know it's a um it was interesting because we read an early copy of that too you know we read yeah, the early one yeah 
yeah and to see kind of your process how it sort of you know changes in little ways and uh, those they enjoyed that too um but um i'm going to go back to our questions here um i think the first uh, question from now was uh, was answered and emily has a second one but james uh forster uh, put up his hand in the middle. So before we go back to Emily and Manal, um, James, let, let's go over to Lakefield because it looks like we're looking at Lakefield. Uh, is, am yes. I right? We're literally right there opposite Prince Andrew Island, right there. <laughs> it's my drone shot. Um, Linwood may remember this, this image. We're, we're working on a 25th anniversary talk that my wife Stephanie, who's here, is going to give to a group in Leaside about the 25 years of the Lakefield literary festival so we're okay. going back in our archives for this one um there so finally get out of the way that's on the, that's on the uh, it's going to recognize who that is oh yeah, holding yeah. The microphone that's sheila and that's on the paddle boat on was that uh stony lake i think yes yep yeah. yeah. that's when uh, i came up talk about last resort that was probably 2001 uh 2002 summer of 2002 okay. i had to look that up myself but uh, it was only one of two times we were on the paddle boat in the 25 years. So I think that was the first year. That was the first one. Very first one. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I thought it, it uh, would be a trip down memory lane for Linwood. Now that's neat. That was, a lot, that was a lot of fun. That was very fun. The whole weekend, I remember that was a lot of fun uh, doing that event. And then I did the festival again, I want to say like five years ago or so. Um, I a little, did a, bit, a little bit more than that um, when you were um, presenting at the barn. That's right, and I was with uh, was with um, I was a couple, three others, two three other crime yeah. writers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's right. That was uh, that was fun too. Fun was yeah. Anyway, we just thought that you would enjoy that uh, memory jog there. The hair, the hair seems to be slightly darker there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know about that. Well, I have just as much of it as I did then. In fact, this year I have way more. But anyway. <laughs> we enjoyed your readings. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thanks, James. That's great, and I, I love the blast from the past. And we'll get back to uh, we we have a few more minutes left, and uh, we'll get back to the, the sidebar. But that made me think of another question. Seeing you, you know, uh, because. Being on a on a boat in Stony Lake, you know, you could say so many things like Barclay floats your boat, and you know, there's there's a lot of great things you could you know promote. You know, where's the craziest place you have ever done a book promotion? Well, maybe one of the the coolest, I think. And the, God, when was this? It must have been. It might have been about ten years ago. I'm trying to think now. Anyway, um, we were in Paris. And we were going to, there's a huge annual big crime fiction festival in Lyon. It's just, that, and they, you know, they, a lot of French crime writers and others like Michael Connolly might be there, Ian Rank and so forth. So I was invited to go there. And so we took the TGV train, that fast, you know, super train that went from Paris to Lyon. And we did a book event on the train. So um, I was stayed in the dining car and they went through the train and they gave out for free paperback editions of my latest book and people were invited to come to the to the bar car and have them signed which we did and so I think it was a I think it was a two hour two and a half hour train ride but it just went like that for me because they shipped the books out and then people came and people were talking to us the whole you know in the, in the car the whole way so I think that was probably the coolest you know um, book event ever and so I'm trying to think what might be number two but that's just got to be up at the top that was pretty neat. That is cool. It takes speed reading to a whole new level, right? <laughs> yes. um, well, as I said, we we're almost to the end of the session. It's going quickly, but I know that, uh, um, is it Manal, you, ha you had a, a new question. Um, did you want to say that to Linwood? Um, yeah, I had a question. How do you find the motivation to write? Contracts. Contracts. Contracts are very motivating because if you don't, you write the book that you have to give the money back. So that's very motivating. Um, and the other thing is, like I say, it's, it's, it's my job. And so, and I mean, I loved, I mean, I've been wanting to write stories since I was, you know, 12 years old. So, so it's, the motivation is there. And I think part of the other motivation is every time you start a book, you think you, you always want the latest book that you write to be the best one you've ever done. 
And because it's there's this kind of elusive perfect book out there. And I don't know if any writers gotten to it, but I think that's why we keep doing this year after year. You know, like I think like Stephen King's still doing a book or two a year. And I think I'm almost certain he don't need the money, but he's probably this days always get another idea. And you need to think, well, what if I don't put this down, if I don't get this idea down, you know, it's what a waste. What's gonna, it's just gonna, it's gonna evaporate. And so that's for me is, is, you know, you get a great idea and you think I got to do it. Every once in a while, I think maybe I should just retire, pack it in. You know, I turned 66 on Saturday and I think, well, maybe everybody else is retiring. Maybe I should do And I think, but what would I do? You know, and I'll get, I'd get some idea in my head and I think that'd make a great book. And then I think, well, I'm not going to do it. And, and so I would really feel, I think I would, I would, that would kind of drive me mad if I had the idea. I mean, it's, I think it's true of in, in other areas of creativity. I mean, if you were a, a singer and you have, or, or a songwriter, and you have a great idea for a song, or if you're a painter and you have a great idea for painting, you just have to get it out. And so I'm lucky that I'm able to make a living doing what I love to do. Um, but I mean, it's no joke that, that contracts are motivating. You know, you sign, your agent gets you a deal and you sign a contract and you've got to, you've got to deliver a book to so-and-so by May 1st. And, uh, and so you've got to get to work. So that's having to pay back the money. You don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. That, that is good motivation, right? And the money keeps you in uh, Batman memorabilia, which is, which is good too. That's Absolutely. All that stuff. <laughs> um, Emily, uh, you have two kind of technical questions. I was wondering if you could blend them together. Yeah, I guess um, my question is how much involvement do you have in um, the entire like book process, like choosing a cover, um, the way it's formatted, and then when it gets made into an audiobook, how much involvement is there for you when it's being recorded, like choosing a narrator, that sort of thing? Usually, uh, so that's the last part. Usually, they'll when they're doing the audiobook, they'll send me uh, sample. They've got it down to three or four people, and they'll send me samples. They say, "Who do you like?" and and I'll listen to them all. And they're all usually great. You know, they're all really good, but I'm like, you know what? I kind of like this one more than this one. So I'll say, I kind of like this guy and they'll, and I'll have him do it. And as far as covers and that and so forth, uh, yeah, there I'm consulted. And, uh, you know, if I, if, if this, if they come up, if their graphic design department or the publisher comes up with a, with a cover that my, I just hate and my agent hates, then we'll talk about it because I mean, they don't want me angry. And sometimes there's compromises. Sometimes, you know, you, you know, so forth for this reason or that. But they're pretty good about consulting. When I was in my early days, earlier, I mean, usually they pick a cover and it's like, you don't like it, too bad. Um, but things are a little better than that now. Great. Well, I have one last question as we're heading into the final moments. Um, this, this came in a bit earlier. Um, so I'm just going to read it verbatim, if you don't mind. It's, it's more, it's about, about character development, Linwood. And it says, this is, this is the author, of, this is the author of this question writing, quote, I've heard authors speak of the fictional character in the story deciding, deciding on what happens next, almost as if they're real, like a live person directing where the storyline goes. I find this fascinating. Can you talk a bit about this? Has this ever happened to you? I don't know. I've heard that. Too. I mean, I, I was a massive Elmore Leonard fan, and Elmore said that, you know, there were certain times characters would just kind of take over the book. And, and I think that sometimes you can be writing and think, as you're in it, you think, this character is better than I thought or has more potential. Um, but I think there's, again, a sort of romanticized notion that these characters take over and so forth. I mean, I kind of feel like I'm in control, you know, like I'm, I decide, made these people up and I'm going to decide what they do. But, but just as, as, and as plot turns can develop in a story that you didn't see coming, characters can start to become more complex or more textures than you at first saw. And, and so to some extent, yeah, I think there's some truth to that. You think I can do more with this character than I realized. I can remember that, I can't, I can't remember which book it was now. I had one book where they just didn't think the character worked and they suggested removing the character. And then I think I did, or else I rewrote the character, but refashioned them differently. And then everybody was like, oh my God, this character is great now. So, but, you know, character is not something that 
I think consciously about as much when I go into, I have a kind of instant sense about characters when I'm writing them, about kind of who they are and what they're like. It's sort of plot and, and the narrative, how it's gonna go is the stuff that I have to sort of stop and think about more is because a lot of times I think a really, a really good thriller, if it works, is kind of like a Swiss watch. Everything kind of has to work together. It has to, it has to, even if you have twists and terms, they need to be, and I hate this cliche, but they need to be kind of organic. They need to be believable. Even if they're wild, it's like, okay, but I can see why that happened. And I, and I think those are the things that, that will make me sort of stop for a while and take a walk and think, how am I going to work that out? And that's not usually a character issue. It's a, it's a plot issue. Thank you. No, that's great. And uh, and since this is being recorded, I'm sure that person will be able to watch this later and say and get the answer that they wanted from the question. Uh, oh, was it your, for your Charmaine? Oh, well, she, she's here. So I'm not even sure why we're recording this because all the people that matter are here right now. So it's a, but, um, this brings us to five o'clock. And so we're right on uh, our hour of fun with Linwood and conversation. Christine, did you have anything to add before we wrap up today's uh, event? Gosh, I just want to thank everybody for coming and uh, and Linwood. I know that you have done uh, events uh, with Lady Eaton before, and uh, and maybe in the future we could look forward to welcoming you back, maybe to Lady Eaton and to Trail, uh, to be able to have some more conversations with our students. Absolutely, um, that would be great. Wonderful. This is great fun. I really appreciate it, and it just the time just flew by. This was great fun and great questions, and it's nice to see everybody. Even if it's on a screen, because you know it's it's God, we're desperate to just see real people. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you again, Linwood. Great to see you. Great to see everyone. Thanks for coming out. And uh, remember, coming up May is it May fifth? Find you first. Yeah, uh, May fourth actually. May fourth. I can show you. Hang on. Don't go oh, away. Okay. Drum roll. Good. Hang on. Hang on. I'm just gonna go. Over. I'll show you. Here's a the UK edition came out um on february 4th but we've got the uh the north american edition is this and it's may 4th so at fine bookstores everywhere as they buy, say. buy it early buy it often folks <laughs> <laughs> and happy birthday to you linwood <laughs> take care everybody bye thanks <laughs>